I thank you for joining us here on Tell Me Your Story, New Paradigms for a New World. I'm Richard Dugan, your host, and it's always a pleasure to be bringing these programs to you. I will dispense with our preliminaries just because I say it all the time, so I'll let you know about all of the good stuff uh, later on in the program. We're going to dive right into our interview with David Erdman, the author of The Ten Commandments of Marriage Secrets of a divorce lawyer. David, thank you so much for joining us on the program. Unfortunately, it's due to the fact that we have what I found out going through my first divorce, uh, David, was technically, legally, a lawsuit. I did not know that at the time. That is correct. That is correct. Welcome to the program and thanks for joining well, us. I'm delighted to be with you, Richard, and delighted to be with your audience. So yes. thank you for the privilege of speaking with them and you. You are very welcome. I'm very interested in the conversation we're going to have. Uh, I don't know why, but the first thing that came to mind when I read the title of the book, The Ten Commandments of Marriage, uh, was I was thinking of Moses coming down, the, uh, down from the mountain, and he was actually carrying three tablets. Oh, no. And uh, this is sort of a comedy bit with uh, Mel Brooks. I see. And, uh, he begins to raise the tablets. I bring you the 15. One of the tablets falls, crashes to the ground. Ten commandments. I've forgotten that. Well, I've, I have used the, uh, the <laughs> image of the two <laughs> remaining tablets on my book. So, so. And yes. I jest, of course. I jest, of course. Uh, but first of all, I want to share with you real quickly that I had a divorce lawyer, female, and her slogan was reasonable solutions for reasonable people. Following my divorce uh, process with her, uh, she got out of the business because she just she'd had enough. She just didn't want to deal with it anymore because of the the bitterness, especially the attorneys. Uh, my ex, my former wife, I don't know if I like calling her my ex, but my former wife, I had an attorney who was a sleazeball. Why do I say that? Because he also helped her sister in her divorce. And mm -hmm. while my former wife and I were in his office waiting for him, what was he doing? Hitting on my former sister-in-law. So kind of tells you where he was coming from. Anyway. Not well, all. May, I, may I respond to what you've already said? Absolutely. I drew a chart. Go ahead. <laughs> this is a chart I show my clients. Uh -huh. I, I, I have a much nicer one I show them, but I drew this for you. Okay. This is the reasonable row and the unreasonable row. And this is the reasonable column. And this is the unreasonable column. Ah. There are four people involved, a husband, a wife, a lawyer, and a lawyer. Right. It only takes one unreasonable person in the universe of four to make the whole process more expensive than it ought to be. Mm -hmm. And and so I always tell a client when we've been fortunate enough to encounter what I call a reasonable lawyer. A reasonable lawyer wants a fair settlement, but they want it at an efficient and fair price. Mm -hmm. um, an unreasonable lawyer wants something they can't get, but they hype their client up for that expectation so they can, I hate to say it, charge more. Mm -hmm. um, but if, if I'm up against some unreasonable lawyer, it's going to be unfortunate because it's going to run my client's fees up unnecessarily. Yeah. Well, and I have to tell you that the process for me began, I was served on May 1st and I was actually able to make the joke, oh, this gives a new meaning to the phrase Mayday. Mayday. Uh, <laughs> anyway, once I kind of got my bearings in June, it took me a month. I was a, I was weird. I was an emotional basket case for a month uh, and uh, went to this uh, lawyer, cost me $50 for the consult, which I would appreciate it. I told her, I says, OK, this is what we've got. I've got there are four things, four elements here. There's the house. Uh, there's the debt. Uh, there's my business. And then there's the divorce, you know, the, the separation. And uh, I was willing, and I, of course, I was something. One of those four is the problem. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's true. That is true. But I, uh, I was giving away the, 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 the farm, so to speak, because I was going to allow her to keep the house. I would take the debt, which I knew what I was going to do with it in the first place. Is that was when I was when we were done with the divorce, I was going to file bankruptcy. It just you know made sense. And of course, that was one of the stipulations in the decree was neither party may discharge the debt through bankruptcy. Well, I found out that's illegal uh, because uh, bankruptcy is federal, a divorce is state, and federal always trumps state. Anyway, um, so. Uh, um, I, I went to her and I proposed this settlement and she looked at it and she said, 
Sounds reasonable to me. So I think that that shouldn't be a problem. Well, eight months later and $3,600 in the hole, they actually finally accepted that proposal. Um, what I suppose I could have done, but I think it would have dragged it out, is saying, okay, this is what I offered you at the beginning of this process. You are going to pay my attorney's fees. That probably would have dragged it out even further. So I just thought, you know, I'm just going to cut bait and get the heck out of the water and, and move on with my life. And that's what I did. And I, I think that there are a lot of people, male and female, who feel that way. This very and, day, I want to tell you, this very day, yes. I, told, I called up a client and said, you know, this lawsuit's just begun. Mm -hmm. Go ahead and make a serious offer to settle the whole thing and see if we can truncate the process and save you some money. Mm -hmm. And under our rules, if we make a written offer and the court ultimately awards the other side less than we offered, they do have to pay our attorney's fees. Now, in what state are you? North Carolina, Charlotte. North Carolina. And obviously, every state has different laws. Arizona, which is where my first divorce uh, took place, uh, was a uh, community property state, which means that she should have gotten half the debt. I should have gotten half the house. And uh, I can walk away with my business, which basically I'm an audio producer. I'm a broadcast producer. So I'm the business. It doesn't matter what equipment I'm working with. You know, and I was working with old stuff, you know, old analog equipment. So they kept that. So how much is your business value? Uh, nothing. There's no value to it unless I do it. You know, that kind of stuff. And they just want I call. Yes, I call that the, um, the squirrel running in the wheel. Um, <laughs> uh, the, the only the only facet of the business that creates income is the hard work inside that wheel. Yeah. And um, and yet um, I don't know how it is in California, but I imagine it's similar. And that is you look at the, how much income this person's made and say, well, if it, it produces that much income, that's a valuable business. So let's talk about it. Yeah. Uh, uh, I actually have been one of the champions here in Charlotte of, 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 of making the point that a solo worker of any sort doesn't have a particularly valuable business, no matter how much money they make. They can't sell it. Yeah, exactly. Sole proprietor, basically. Yeah. By the way, I learned a very valuable lesson in 1994 when I first uh, tried to go uh, to, to start my business, which was called Fast Forward Audio Communications. I get to the end of the year. I start filing my taxes, did not know I had to file out these extra forms. When it was all said and done, I owed about as much to the IRS as I did in my divorce in, two th in 1998. 98, 99, actually, 99, uh, $3,000. Uh, and that's when I shut the business down. Uh, ostensibly, I was no longer going to uh, uh, do that. And I said, the next time I open my business, I start a business, I'm going to make sure that as the first member of my staff is a CPA who will, <laughs> sure, who will make sure and probably have to have a lawyer too. Maybe I can get one who's a CPA slash lawyer, you know. Kill two birds with one stone. I want to ask you before we continue here, why would you get involved in these kinds of, they are domestic situations where, again, you know, it's a lot of times that the emotions are running just sky high most of the time. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to tell you that I believe that people going through a divorce Typically, if they've never been through one before, of course, it's a first experience for them. And to a very large extent, they, uh, they, they absorb the personality of their lawyer. If their lawyer says, let's go beat the tar out of them, the client thinks, well, that's the way it's supposed to be. If their lawyer says, there's got to be a better way than going to full boil on the, on the stove from the very beginning, Let's start at one and work up through the numbers on the stove dial. Um, if the lawyer says that, then the client typically accepts that as the right approach. And so that's been my approach my entire career. And so, so it's not as difficult for me and my client. It's difficult when we, when we get the roadblock thrown up by the unreasonable person in the other box. Um, but, but, but my job, I'm not a golfer, but I understand in golf, you play the ball where it lies. I have to play it where it lies when they come in the, in the room and we talk about where they are. Also, I'm 
blessed to be the son of a, of a father who was an excellent surgeon and had a placid, calming bedside manner. And I think I absorbed a little bit of that. So I'm not, I, I care very much about my clients and I think about them a lot, but I do um, have pretty good boundaries in my own mind. Well, I, I got to tell you, it, it is fascinating to me uh, to look into a lot of this because Ever, again, th these are all state matters, and each state has different laws, and, and you wherever you're living is what you have to deal with. I don't think right. it's... Uh, uh, of course, then there's the other issue, too. There are a lot of people out there who are not... There's no certificate. They have what's called a common law marriage. Yeah. And some, some states have that. Yeah. My state does not. I have, I'm aware of it. I'm sorry? Well, we all know that Lee Marvin, didn't he get into trouble with... a, a, a some sort of common law marriage, the actor. I think, isn't, that what, isn't that what happened to him? Yeah, I think um, you're right. By and, the way, I think it's kind of funny that a guy from North Carolina is having any conversations to advise people in California. And of course, I'm not giving legal advice in California. No, no, but no. Uh, I, I, I do think if you've watched Matlock uh, years ago, uh, they look at the Southern lawyer and, and say, well, that's that's different. Yeah. And the, the marriage aspect is pretty much the same. Yeah across yeah. america i would say the laws are different as you say exactly we're talking with uh, david erdman he is the author of a book we're talking about among other things we're going to talk about is the 10 commandments of marriage secrets of a divorce lawyer and that is why we have him on the program because regardless of the different laws from one state to another, you're still dealing with the same kind of dynamics. And we're going to talk about that as we continue here on Tell Me Your Story, where new paradigms for a new world is what we're trying to bring forward. And we're trying to understand the different choices that are available to you, give you the knowledge of those choices, the ins and outs, if you will, to help make your dreams come true. And yes, if that is that you, you, <laughs> like me, you wanted your freedom after your first marriage, or you'd like maybe to find a way to fix it, you know, just because you're, and, and David, you'd probably uh, uh, agree with this at, at, to some level, uh, you'd really love to be able to bring the divorce proceedings to a halt by virtue of figuring out how you can bring these people together, not specifically you, because you're not a therapist per se, or, or a counselor or a mediator, but it, it, you know, boy, it would be nice to save all that money, that time, that angst to try to fix it. Well, the reason people ought to do, uh, ought to address their marriages in a, by the way, let's, let's go back a step. Sure. The reason I wrote the book is not because I want people to get divorced. It's absolutely because I want people to learn how to avoid getting divorced. And when a lawyer like myself, and so I wrote a book called The Ten Commandments of Marriage, Secrets of a Divorce Lawyer, the, the subtitle was designed to intrigue the potential reader into thinking they're going to learn some secrets. Mm -hmm. Well, they are going to learn some secrets, but there, I have sat through more than 5,000 initial consultations with people who are in some stage of distress in their marriage. And from that, I haven't learned 5,000 ways to mess up a marriage, but I've certainly seen a hundred or more. And so by writing and putting in the positive, one of the things I say about my 10 commandments is nine out of the 10 of them are positive suggestions. The only negative suggestion is thou shalt not allow children to obstruct the marriage. This is a problem sometimes with very young children, um, mothers sometimes, um understandably mm. are so attached to the child they've just to whom they've just given birth that they don't want the daddy to drop the child and and all of a sudden the child is a, something of an obstacle all of my other commandments are positive like thou shalt learn to resolve differences and you don't have to come to a lawyer if you can do it yourself right and and in fact the tenth one is thou shalt learn to apologize and forgive because we're working our way through all the aspects of a marriage. I'm particularly a believer that, that equality between the spouses is, 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 the, is the guiding principle. And in fact, I talk about, and people, I'll tell you who ought to read this book. Anybody who's thinking of having a premarital agreement ought to read the book. 
I'm not opposed to them completely because there are valid reasons. I use the, um, I use the Notting Hill story. You know, in Notting Hill, uh, Julia Roberts is a world famous actress by a different name. Mm -hmm. And she falls in love with the bookstore keeper in uh, Notting Hill. And uh, at, dear, I write about this because I think it's fascinating. On the one hand, she goes back to him at the end of the movie and says, I'm just a girl who wants to be loved by a boy. Mm -hmm. Well, that's equality. If he says back, I just want to be loved by you. But you know what happens with a real movie star? Mm -hmm. Five lawyers get involved in writing their premarital agreement. And all of a sudden, Julia Roberts and, and her uh, movie star husband are no longer equal, and they're not going to be equal. Yeah. Now, if I were the lawyer for that bookstore keeping husband, I'd say, you know what? She is a world famous star and she has acquired this on her own. But how about this? From the day you get married forward, it's a 50 50 proposition. If she comes in with $47 million and keeps it separate, that's hers. But if she makes 50 more million while you're married, I think that should be 50 50. Mm. And of course, the other person's lawyers are saying, no, 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 this movie star has a sort of a, a, a stream of income. And again, stream of income from before the marriage, I agree. Mm -hmm. Newly created, because you know what? If those two people get married and they have children and the actress is off filming for 90 days far away, who's taking care of the little kids? The husband at that point. And so um, I, if, if you've got anybody listening to the audience who's thinking about a premarital agreement, I'd like them to see the pros and the cons in this book, The Ten Commandments of Marriage, and think long and hard about the damage that can be wrought to their relationship by the lawyers getting involved contractually yeah. designing their marriage. Yeah. No good. No good. David Erdman's my guest, and we're talking about the Ten Commandments of Marriage. Um, uh, and actually, yes, that's right. The 10, com uh, I've just uh, scrolled away from it. There it is. The 10 Commandments of Marriage, Secrets of a Divorce Lawyer. Secrets of Divorce Lawyer, right, uh, which is David Erdman. And uh, you can go to a website, which is erdmanforcharlotte.com. We'll talk a little bit about that in a few. I, I actually I actually have a new website. Uh, uh, it's, uh, it's called, uh, the, the, I believe it's still called the 10 Commandments of Marriage.com. Okay. All right, then we will send people to that website. We'll be linked to it as well so that people can find out more about both you as well as the work that you are doing. Very uh, nice of you. Continue our conversation with David here on Tell Me Your Story. I'm Richard Dugan, your host. And uh, uh, one of the things that I find so interesting, David Erdman, author of The Ten Commandments of Marriage, is that I've heard this said that we need to make it harder to get married so that it is that much more difficult or avoidable to get divorced. You won't need the need for it. Now, my parents, who have been married for 65 years to each other, one, one, one time, one time. My father and mother are still alive, doing well. My dad's 90, mother's 87. And I wanted, I wanted to compete with them for longevity of marriage. I was married when I was 23. I am now 61. All right. I could be in two years, could have been, I should say, celebrating 40 years. Unfortunately, it lasted 15. Uh, I'm now in my second relationship, again, common law, 23 years. And um, so it's, it's like you have to read a manual and pass both a written and a practical test to drive a motor vehicle, a machine that could kill another human being. And I have to tell you, and I'm not proud of this, I've hit another human being with my vehicle. Thank God it was from a dead stop. I was turning left onto a side street, and so I was barely accelerating. Uh, he actually walked away. He walked wow. away from the situation, even, but there was still a claim. There was still a settlement. No players were involved, which was very nice, according to my uh, uh, agent. But 
Uh, yet, when it comes to a marriage license, there is no manual to read. There is no written and or practical test to take. And it seems as though uh, we place a great deal of, of a great deal more value on the operating of a machine than we do the operating, shall we say, of a relationship in the context of marriage. Well, I'm, I'm going to I'll tell you something that you might find interesting. Uh, some states have what is called a covenant marriage. North Carolina does not have that. I don't know if California has it, but a covenant marriage is is literally in the statutes and they have it in Louisiana. Um, if if a person if they get people can get married like you or I got married in a normal, simple ceremony mm -hmm. in a covenant marriage, it's a higher process to get married and it's a near about impossible to get unmarried and um i've been told by clients who came from louisiana that this originated from uh, hurricane katrina that uh people were leaving their marriages to get out of the state or get away from the hurricane fear and so the legislature um again i've been told i haven't researched it myself because i don't louisiana don't do louisiana law but uh, the legislature created this brand of marriage, covenant marriage, which is harder to get out of. You have to be separated longer and you have to do certain uh, acts to get out of it. So what you're describing sort of exists even in America. Yeah. But no, you're correct. Yes, you're correct. Yeah. There are no rules yeah. uh, for it. Uh, people have to make it work for themselves. Now, I've, I've had on this program a couple, we were talking about marriage, and uh, they are both uh, uh, faith believers, okay? okay. And um, got into the conversation about what constitutes a marriage, because the first marriage, if we want to call it that, uh, was between okay. Adam and Eve. Right. Well, there was nobody to perform the ceremony, so they were common law, at least by my, by my definition, they would have been common law marriage, married. Yeah. Um, and of course, they were partners in the whole thing until, quite honestly, from the way I recall the story from Genesis, um, I have a feeling that Adam sort of threw Eve under the bus. You know, after they partook of the uh, of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, um, you know, kind of God said, "What the heck's going on here?" Well, she she, you know, I mean, that's kind of the story. It's her fault because she ate the apples. Like, wait a minute, you're a partners in this. Then that's one of the things that I want to well, talk a little bit. Well, about. They, they both got banished. They did both get banished. He was just as guilty as she was, regardless of the fact. But I want to talk about the the uh, uh, aspect of the partnership, and you talk about them being equal. There's an element within modern day relationships where, and you kind of alluded to this in terms of the finances, because that always seems to be like at the top of the list when it comes to how they're what they're going to divvy up the debts and the assets. When one of the partners once married wants to have and they don't have any other assets okay they have no other she she doesn't have 43 million dollars that she's bringing with her all right you're, you're kind of both starting out square one and you said both of them are getting married okay i want to make sure not getting divorced yet not divorced no 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 they're in the marriage they're okay. getting married right, they're not married they're actually married now oh okay and they decide okay we're going to go to the bank and we need to open a joint account that we both will have access to equal access to so we both will know, and of course, in, in today's modern day, uh, you put the app on your phone, you can constantly see how much money we've got so that we don't overdraw. But one of the partners wants to have their own account. Some it, people call that financial infidelity. And seems to me, yes, that's kind of where I'm going with this. It seems to me that that person and again, I'm not casting aspersions or judgment here because that's just what they've chosen to do. But it does seem to me, yes, that this person apparently feels that either uh, uh, one of the elements is they want a certain element of independence from their partner, their partner. OK, and 
So when it comes to paying bills, all of their income goes into their account, and they must then transfer whatever's needed in order to cover the bills, which makes it very complicated to the other partner who might be doing that, taking care of them. Now, let's throw one more element into the mix, my friend. By the way, what you described so far is very common. Okay. And, it's, and, and I liked what you said. It's financial infidelity. Um, the other person likes to have the money to spend, does not want to know about the details other than to know there's enough money in the account to spend. That's right. And that when the financial details do come out, they get all flustered and upset and bent out of shape. And it's like, well, if we had one account that you have access to, that you would have an app on your phone to see how much we have, so that you don't overdraw the account, we wouldn't be having this conversation. And you might, you, you might, you might, you and, might be right, but, uh, but uh, you, right. you know, let, let me give you a basic lawyer rule. Thing. It's a lot easier to divide up assets than it is to divide debts. Oh, so, yeah. so, so if, if, if the other spouse has their own account and can't overdraw it, in other words, they can't go five or ten thousand dollars into a line of credit uh then whether they got zero in there is their problem but of course if they do run a big debt and then there's a divorce uh, it's both people's problem yeah because they are married so everything that each of them may have as in an individual is theirs collectively as the married couple that's our law too it, yeah, in Arizona, that is the case, um, you know, and so forth. Now, I want to come back uh, in just a moment uh, to talk about the Ten Commandments. I want to go through them slowly, one by one. I know there's someone out there going, Richard, you keep mentioning the title of the book. It's the Ten Commandments of Marriage. What the heck are they? And he's, you know, he's already mentioned one. <laughs> shall we say the one negative one so to speak about children uh getting in the way of the couple so to speak uh, that's i'm paraphrasing here uh, by the way i love children but, no, but... and i know you do and i do too i don't have any but i think they're great i just want other people to have them <laughs> right well uh maybe maybe even so you'll understand that the uh, that uh, oh, one of the images i use let's talk about the children issue for just a minute because it might seem uh, as if I believe somehow negative on children. Th that's not it at all. See, this, the situation is this. Most people will tell you, and here you are a product of a marriage of two people that's lasted all these years. Mm -hmm. That's They had a solid core together, and whatever children, whatever siblings you may have had, and you were in the orbit around that solid core. And so you saw what good looks like. Mm -hmm. You saw it and, uh, and you benefited from it. Uh, that's that. So what I'm saying is if you put the children between the parents, you're messing up the marriage and ultimately you're not serving the children well. I love the phrase you used. They're in the orbit around the married couple, the parents. We're going to talk more about that as we continue here on Tell Me Your Story, New Paradigms for a New World. I'm Richard Dugan, your host. My guest today is David uh, Erdman. David Erdman is uh, here. He's talking about the Ten Commandments of Marriage, and the, basically these are the secrets of divorce, for, uh, of secrets from a divorce lawyer, and that is David Erdman. And you can go to the Ten Commandments of Divorce.com to find out more about the book and David as well, who, interestingly enough, I, I kind of like this, David, was born on the 4th of July. And there's a song with that line in there somewhere. I, That's right. That's George M. Cohan. <laughs> A real live nephew of my Uncle Sam, born on the 4th of July. And at that, I was born on a Marine base. So, a Camp Lejeune. There you, there you go. Absolutely. Well, we want to jump into the Ten Commandments. And uh, I know that you've got them numbered, but however you wish to present them from highest priority to lowest, I know that they all have their level of importance. Where shall we begin? Number one, the ten, the first commandment. If, if the first and as sort of to paraphrase the Bible and the greatest commandment is thou shalt be equals. That's the first one. And 
people who master thou shalt be equals don't need the other nine because they okay. don't need me to tell them how to run their lives or their marriage. But for the people who don't master number one, they need to be told number two, mm -hmm. thou shalt be a team. Think of yourselves as a team, a partnership. What's good for one of you is good for both of you and feel that way. By the way, uh, before we go on to three, just those two alone bring to mind a question that was posed to me in, re in reference to thinking about my relationship. And the question was, and she said, don't answer it now, think about it. What does unity look like to you in a relationship? And of course, you nailed it in the last, uh, in our last segment there, in regards to the role model that I had of my parents. Yeah. Now let's look at number three. Number three is thou shalt stay close to your spouse. This is a little bit touching on the issue of infidelity. When people, rather than running again, let's use the orbit, use the orbit image again. If people are running in separate orbits in their lives. I'm not saying that's not a good marriage. That's for them to decide. Mm -hmm. However, I am going to say that the odds of them not needing each other and not needing the relationship grow as they go in different orbits. So I say, if the wife is doing something and she says, would you like to come along to her husband? He should say yes. And furthermore, if, if he doesn't, if she doesn't, if he doesn't get invited, he said, may I come along? So that they're doing things together. They're seen together mm -hmm. by lots of people because, yeah. because that's part of, that's, again, I understand some marriages work with great distances between them, but the best marriages that last are doing as much as possible together. And that's why I say commandment number three, thou shalt stay close to your spouse. Commandment number four is something we all want, and that is to be appreciated. Mm -hmm. And I call it, thou shalt appreciate your spouse. You know, we, we thought our spouses were fantastic when we married them. We thought we were fortunate to get to marry them. And our jaded eyes sometimes look at what we'd like to change about our spouse and well, can I use another biblical quote? The moat in the eye that uh, somebody criticized um, Jesus, and he says, "What about the log in your own?" Uh, it's a matter of it's a matter of, of of recognizing what's great about your spouse, and and sometimes people need to be reminded about what's great about their spouse because you know when infidelity starts. It's often because someone else does appreciate your spouse. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, the fifth commandment. Before you go on to five. Okay. Uh, raises a very interesting point uh, in that the, the, the roles of men and women, not husbands and wives, but men and women has changed a bit, and especially in light of the Me Too movement. Now, I was raised with four sisters, a brother, a mother, and a father. Wow. So I was in the minority <laughs> okay. and I'm proud to have been in the minority because they taught me a lot, not just about what women were like, but about their intelligence, their independence, their confidence, etc. By the way, everything you're saying is great. I, I, I endorse that. Now, here's the deal. It, I want to say it used to be, okay, it used to be that when you, it, that you would uh, constantly be, even after you get married, uh, the man would always make the overtures. The man would always woo. The man would always do all of those things to show the woman. That's not to say that she didn't, but the stereotype was it was all the man's job to make sure, as the phrase goes, happy, happy wife, happy life, right? Well, have you, I don't know if you've read any of my book, but the next commandment is thou shalt communicate. This is to both sexes. Mm -hmm. Thou shalt communicate your needs to make sex fulfilling for both of you. I have to get into sex because it's part of marriage. Yes. And my, my point is 
uh, did, did, yes, you talk about the wooing. Well, I think I don't, I don't, I don't pick on women. I don't pick on men, but I do make the point that if somebody's going to come in my office and say, we're not having a satisfactory sex life. And I sympathize with that. And, and I'm sorry to hear it. And, it, and, and by the way, if the sex isn't good, the marriage is potentially going to be challenged. But does this person know, for example, if it is the woman, that she's got to make it clear what she wants and needs out of the sexual relationship? So uh, when you're four sisters, you probably never talked about sex with them. Hmm. But, but if their marriages are good, well, I'm not going to go with your parents. If, if, if your sisters have had good marriages, then they have found a way, the husband and wife, to, to know what each other wants and to communicate what they themselves want to make it work. Well, believe it or not, my, my sister, my older sister, who is about a year older than I, and I have had that kind of a conversation recently. Wow. Uh, though she doesn't go into any, obviously, in any detail, because I know for her it's, it's you know, it's a little more you know, private, a little more personal, a little more sensitive, and I get that. Um, I'm a little more open in that regard. Um, but here's the other element that I want to throw out there. Now, uh, I even shared this question with my sister. Uh, I would love to ask mom and dad when the last time it was that they had sex. Now, my dad's 90, my mother's 87. And we both know, David, you and I both know that our biology, our chemistry changes as we get older. I mean, especially, for example, from the single digit years into the teen years, into the 20s, 30s, 40s, uh, guys are just going nuts wanting to sow their wild oats, as it were. Um, but as we get, I'm 61, all right? My chemistry has shifted, but there are other, there are other factors I'll, I'll share with you later that my, I, I, I don't mind sharing this. I honestly don't because uh, I look okay. at it. Before you do, okay. I want you to know, I don't ask clients personal questions. Right. I say, you can tell me what you want to tell right. me and you right. can keep secrets of what you want to see. Right. But if you want my legal opinion, you may be better tell me enough that I can give you sound advice. Now you say what you want, but it's sure. not because I'm making it. No, no, I understand. But, uh, and I look at it this way, God already knows every little tiny detail about my life, right? That's right. Omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent. So what difference does it make if 8 billion other people know? And besides, most of them don't even care. They're too busy living their lives. By the way, I hope your audience is 8 billion. I've got op op optimism for my book. I'm, I'm shooting for that. I'm shooting. We're at 52,000 listens on uh, SoundCloud and other uh, uh, podcast outlets and some 17 to 19,000 on YouTube. So uh, the numbers That's are right. rising. But um, my libido basically is dropped off okay well, well th th that's that's one of aging gracefully yeah. is is one of the basic rules not in my book but in that famous saying the the uh, the uh desiderata that says uh, uh, yes it talks about it talks about uh, uh you are a child now. of the universe, no less than the trees and the stars. You have a right to be here. Right to be here, whether it is no, uh, aware, known to you or not. The earth, the, the world, the universe is unfolding as That's right, exactly as it should. And somewhere <laughs> in there, it talks about uh, aging gracefully, and um, I've forgotten the exact wording of it. But mm -hmm. yes, I, I I remember it. Yes, and, and I like that you can quote it. Good job. Uh, well, I, I listened to it many, many times in the 70s. As a matter of fact, it's a piece that we actually use uh, at the end of our broadcasts, among other things, uh, to, uh, to just try to keep people's minds focused on what's really important in their lives. Um, but uh, here's the thing. What happens when, and, 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 I'm, and I'm curious as to whether you have been able to negotiate with the parties and yeah, the other lawyer, when it comes to these kinds of issues, sexual issues, the intimacy issues and saying, look, we have changed and we're not able to meet each other's needs the way we used to. And what we had before, oh my God, we were animals with each other and it was wonderful and exciting and thrilling. But now we're, 
in our later years no. and things right. changed biologically and it's nobody's fault it well, isn't anybody's fault well, it's just what happened now, now when you were married you probably gave a vow about sickness and in health i do remember that line yes <laughs> for better or for poor richer for poor for better you know that type of thing yeah and and yeah not only do we have to age gracefully we like our spouses to age gracefully mm -hmm. so when we see uh, a, a man of some advanced age with some young starlet we have our suspicions about whether that's good for her yeah uh, but uh who am i to judge well uh, we're not here to pass judgment on anybody we don't want to do that what we want to do is help people through what can be a very uh, traumatic and tumultuous time as we continue talking with david erdman on tell me your story new paradigms for a new world i'm richard dugan your host and we are discussing the uh, the 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 ten commandments of marriage secrets of a divorce lawyer david erdman uh, is our guest and the ten commandments Dot com is the website. We encourage you to go there. We are linked to that website, so people can go to your website there, David. I'll, I'll, I'll get you that correct, exact website. It's probably the Ten Commandments of Marriage dot com. All right, but, Ten Commandments but, of Marriage. Did I just say? I'll, I'll get you that. Yeah. Um, I think the, if you go to Ten Commandments dot com, you're going to get the Ten Commandments. Very likely. <laughs> and 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 in fact, interestingly enough, I wrote the book, The Ten Commandments of Marriage, based on a speech that I had been giving for probably 15 years wow. to church groups and occasional civic groups. And people would come up and say, you ought to put this in a book. So when I wrote the book, I didn't pay any attention to the fact that there are other people who've written books called the 10 commandments of marriage, but none of them say secrets of a divorce lawyer. That's there my book. There you go. And, and I noticed that I'd like to say that, that looking at it from a lawyer's point of view is, is a little, tougher on telling the truth you know if you if you if you if you if, if, if you want a religious book uh i'm i'm religious but if you want a religious book there are religious books that are very clear i mean every every third page is going to say what jesus or moses said about the issue right uh, i quote jesus a little bit but i'm really without names quoting clients and and what has worked and what i see would make a difference and i haven't said this yet but i want to i want to say it uh, i have always viewed as my greatest successes in my business the people who ended up getting back together oh yeah and i have i've run into those people when i go out in the town and somebody walks up to me and says you saved our marriage and i go right back and say no you saved your marriage. Mm. I congratulate you. I applaud you, and I'm proud of you. Uh, I don't take any credit, but the credit I would be entitled to take is I didn't make it impossible, like some lawyers who scorch the earth between the people and <laughs> yeah. make it impossible. It's the scorched earth concept there, you know, right. burn it all to the ground and just start over. By the way, there was, and I still have the audio tapes, the cassette tapes of what, what's called the Maximum, Maximum, I think that's what it is, Maximum Marriage Series. Hmm. And it was by a, a, a Christian gentleman, uh, and he was married, and he would share these stories, and he talked about experiences that he had in his, in his he was not a lawyer, he was a therapist. And he had the, the, who would have the couple in the room. And he used this, he told this one story of uh, the couple that was there and the woman, she was just blasting the husband. I mean, just, he was just awful, you know, ought to be sent to hell for being the way he was. And he looked over at the husband and the husband is over in his chair cowering and tears are streaming down his face. And I have to tell you that I don't, I will, I do not speak ill of my former wife nor my present wife to others or in her presence i never put them down that's right i it's it's like what are you doing you just built this incredible incredible thing the two of you and you're going to chip away at it 
Are you? And I see this happening all the time in the grocery stores and out on the streets walking. And, and of course, we see this a lot on television where one of the spouses is always trying to get one up on the other. And I, I look at that going, wait a minute. You're a t we talked about this already. You're a team. You're partners. What are you? Why are you trying to get one up on the other and hide stuff? I hate that. I, you know, I hate seeing that stereotype, but it's out there. Um, we want to. No, they're not being equals. So Without they failed being... on the first commandment. Yeah. And they're not being a team. Nope. They failed on the next commandment. Second commandment. And they're not appreciating their spouse. They exactly. failed on that commandment. Uh, by the way, if they had just made sex fulfilling for both of them, maybe they'd overlook those other things. It's quite possible. And um, the other aspect of appreciation, uh, I at least once if not more than once a day i tell my wife that i love her uh that i appreciate at her. least every phrase. day at least one time you betcha uh we have this gaelic phrase we learned when we took a gaelic course ah. uh, and it's slan gafal we have calls with it when i left her this morning she was home ill today so she stayed home from work i said i love you and slan gafal which means in gaelic um uh, uh, I will, I will see you later. Okay. Goodbye. And like hasta mañana, or is it like, I'll see you in, yes, the, exactly. in the afterlife, <laughs> but I do it in Gaelic because I like the sound okay. of it better. And so, okay. did and of course, when I'm on the phone and there are other people in the room, they say, what did you just say to her? I went, said, oh, said slang, of fall. slang of fall. Slon, slon, S O S L O N. Uh, I think it would be phonetically guffal, G U, G U F, A L, guffal, and you can maybe talk, speak that into your phone, into an Slum app. Slum guffal. Yeah. Great. What is the Irish trans? What is the English translation of the Irish word slan guffal? And you know, and it should be goodbye until later. Uh, so I do that on a regular basis, uh, showing her that I appreciate her. I appreciate everything she does. Uh, and even my first wife, the same thing. Uh, not so much this long of fall. But when I talk about my former wife, in spite of the divorce, I say, man, we had some great times. We went and did this and we went and did that. And we used to bicycle on a tandem bicycle all over Phoenix. Uh, for 15 years, we did this, you know, and yeah, it ended in divorce. And so the, the end was not so great, but every, everything before it wasn't bad. It was actually good. I, and I, by the way, that's another thing. Uh, we talk on this program, David, about the power of words that I, I say this very emphatically. Yes. Words have power. Yes, so you need to take responsibility. Yeah, you have the constitutional right of freedom of speech. Sure you do. But I personally believe that our founders left out the phrase, but you also take on the responsibility for the words that you have spoken freely. We have to believe that our founders intended that thought and, and assumed, maybe assumed mistakenly, that, uh, that uh, everybody would honor that. Yeah, George Washington, for darn sure, was very conscious. Of, he, he didn't write the Bill, the Bill of Rights, but uh, George Washington was very conscious of, of decorum. Yeah. and being a good person absolutely uh, and and he he would um, endorse responsibility for words absolutely you know, i find i find uh, uh, that many when again this is when i was working at the christian station in the 80s and early 90s uh and that word was abhorrent to take responsibility for your life it was either good things and that was god Bad things, oh, and that was the devil. And it's like, what are you, a puppet on a string being manipulated by forces you don't understand? I don't think so. And so I take full responsibility for my life and the things that I say, the things that I do. And quite honestly, even though I don't always have control over them, the things that I think. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're going to uh, pause here for just a moment. I need to remind our listeners, this is Tell Me Your Story, New Paradigms for a New World. We come your way here on this program via the radio airwaves, terrestrial, at 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. on Sundays, 1 a.m. on Mondays, and then... Wednesdays at 9 a.m. That is our special edition of Tell Me Your Story. And I have to tell you, uh, with David here on the program, this is a special edition of Tell Me Your Story. I'm very grateful that he's with well, us. Thank you. 
Uh, we are also podcasting on SoundCloud and iTunes and TuneIn Radio with 52,000 listens in less than four years. And uh, we're also on iHeartRadio and um, many other locations on the Internet. And you can watch these interviews on YouTube. Just go to the Tell Me Your Story with Richard Dugan tell, uh, website or, or channel, I should say. And uh, you can uh, watch these interviews and you can meet David at least virtually as we have our conversation. I want to now jump into the Sixth Commandment. All right. The Sixth Commandment is, Thou shalt be visibly married. This also has to do with the threat of infidelity. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I happen to wear a wedding ring. I've been wearing this one for 37 years. And, um, and, and I, this is the only wedding ring I've ever had. But I believe in wearing it because when people come in my office, by the way, we're sitting in the, off my conference room, which is why mm -hmm. I say that I am. Mm -hmm. When people come in my office and they've got the ring still on, that usually tells me they want to try to save this marriage. If they've already taken the ring off, that usually means they're done with the marriage. So mm -hmm. that's a pretty strong signal coming from just a little band of gold. But of course, I listen to see if their particular view is consistent with this generalization. Mm -hmm. But I, I'm a big, I'm a big proponent of both parties wearing a wedding ring and being visibly married. And I'm going to move on to the seventh because this is an interesting concept. My seventh commandment is thou shalt lead a marriage centered life. When I described that, that, that core that your own parents had with five children in the orbit around them, mm -hmm. the marriage as the center of the life of their lives was understood by the kids. The parents were a team. I'm satisfied they must have been to be together even until your daddy's 90 as he is. Uh, the kids understood that the parents were a team and that they were leading a marriage centered life. And that's, that's, that's probably the most difficult of my commandments because people, when, 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 when I'm a single man once upon a time and I married a single woman, how do two people merge and not give away who they are? I believe in synergism. I believe they one plus one is more than two. Yeah. In fact, we see couples who, let's say just in business, accumulate millions of dollars because they work together as a team, a partnership where they trusted each other. And so um, I'm, I'm, um, I'm a big proponent of leading a marriage centered life. Well, I'll tell you that my parents, uh, when I was probably in my preteens, 10, 11, 12, maybe 13, um, they brought all six of us together. There were actually six. And by the way, uh, people think, oh my gosh, your parents must have sacrificed a lot to have you guys, especially with the visual impairments and the asthma, and then of course all the instruments and this and that. And, the other. and I have actually had my parents on this program. It's been several years. It has not been released to the public and probably won't until they're passing, which could be quite a while. But in that interview, I asked them about that, and they said, absolutely not. We sacrificed nothing because we wanted a big family, whatever form that took. Anyway, oh. they called us all together, and they said, we want to participate in a, a program to help our marriage called Marriage Encounter. And of course, born and raised Catholic, that was through the Catholic Church. And I think for the most part in unison, we all agreed that, look, mom and dad, if that's what you want to do, we're with you. We, and there's six of us. If we can't keep this house going, we're not trying. Okay. Because we all knew how to do the dishes because we had those chores. We knew right. how to do the laundry and all those types of things, right? You were raised well. I, I'd like to believe that, and I actually do believe that, um, and I feel so good about that. Now, it was not Norman Rockwell. Uh, it was not a Norman Rockwell painting. And for those of you younger listeners and viewers, Google it, okay? <laughs> Google it. <laughs> but I, I, uh, I can't, re I think I shared before, I don't think I've ever, rem I can't remember a time when my parents ever fought in front of us, if they even did or, or what have you. 
they definitely worked together on the finances. Now, my dad did work on the car. He couldn't drive. He has the same had the same visual impairment that I had before I got my lens implant. But he knew how to work on the car and fix, work on the engine and change the oil and and check the tires and blah blah blah. Uh, my mother did most of the cooking, although my dad is a great cook too. He makes some great refried beans. Oh, oh man. Um, but one of the, the aspects of all of this that really comes home to me, that even if I cannot pass it on to my children, which I don't have any, uh, I want to pass it on through these programs, uh, through my example, even with my first wife and our home, that, the first home that we ever bought had a two-car two dr um, uh, uh, carport. So you had a nice wide side, uh, a sidewalk, you know, two-car sidewalk, and they had a basketball pole. And I put up a uh, backboard and, and rim. I painted it with the Phoenix Suns logo. I took a lot of time to do that. And I invited the kids in the neighborhood to come over and play. And I said, this is not a competitive court. You are here to have fun. Okay? We're not, you know, this is not Charles Barkley and Michael Jordan going head to head here. Okay? Uh, and unfortunately, one of the kids, and I never found out who it was, apparently leaped up and grabbed the rim, broke it off of the backboard. I took it down. I was so disheartened because nobody would own up to it. And but I before that happened, I was trying to foster the same kinds of things my parents shared with me as far as embracing, if you will, the children in the neighborhood, the kids in the neighborhood saying, look, here is a safe place for you guys to play if you want to. Uh, because nice. I knew that the alternative was that they'd get into all kinds of trouble and what have you. Um, you know, and that was just my little part. I'm, I'm hoping that something rubbed off on them. What about you in terms of your life? And we'll get back to number seven here in a minute. Uh, but, um, what about you and your, your legacy through, uh, you know, not just the work that you do, but also maybe your offspring? Well, I'm, I'm very privileged. My, my wife and I uh, have two adult daughters. Uh, in fact, uh, they're, they're, I put their pictures on the back of the book because, Oh. That sells a lot better than a picture of me. I like that. Uh, uh, Good. But, uh, but my daughters are both very accomplished. One is a nurse anesthetist. She's married to a dentist. Um, and, and they have a very happy marriage. And the other is also very happily married. Uh, she is a school teacher in Manhattan. Um, and uh, they're doing great. And so I'm very proud of our children. And by the way, I always say our children. I don't say my children because they are. I'm part of this marriage. And then uh, we have a couple of grandchildren. Uh, they're so young that I haven't had a chance to uh, really teach them very much. But if I live long enough, I hope to share many, many experiences with my grandchildren as I did with our daughters as they were growing up. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we, we, we've, uh, we've been very fortunate and um, the arguments have been very few. Well, and then, and have you ever looked back at those few arguments and, and thought, what the heck were we arguing about? It's so unimportant or, you know, whatever the case well, might be. Well, I must, I must have done it because, because um, my commandment nine is thou shalt learn to resolve differences. And you know what that means? That means to argue without breaking up the marriage over it. And then commandment 10 is so important and probably the one I need the most. Uh, from my wife. And that is, I'll apologize and she's going to forgive. That's the plan. And vice versa when necessary. Mm -hmm. I, I, my 10th my commandment is thou shalt apologize and forgive. Because that's a two-part transaction. One person apologizes, but it doesn't do any good if the other person doesn't accept that apology and complete that. And, and, and as, as a Sunday school teacher of mine once said, um, uh, it brings closure to whatever the controversy has been, both apologizing and forgiving. They bring closure and we move on. And, and by the way, I, I, I don't, I, I won't, my clients, by the way, are always happy to know that I've been privileged and blessed to be happily married because they believe me when I say to them, I am not in the business of breaking up marriages. And I've said that phrase to a client as recently as 24 hours ago, a new client. Mm -hmm. I am not in the business of breaking up marriages. But, but there's a right way and a wrong way to deal with the legalities of a marriage that 
I can't apparently save and they can't apparently save. And that is again, to try to find, try to find something that's fair mm -hmm. and try to find it as quickly and as inexpensively as possible. And by no means are legal fees inexpensive. Yeah. But they can be fortunes and they shouldn't have to be fortunes. They should be proportional to what's being dealt with. Um, and so if a man's got the house and the business and the things you were naming, um, the fees ideally would be proportional to that. We're talking with David Erdman and uh, the website, uh, the Ten Commandments of Marriage.com. And we encourage you to go there. We'll be linked. We'll have the link there. All you have to do is click on it and boom, it's going to take you right there. Boy, would you give, we can do this off, off the line if you wish, but I want to make sure I have your email address. I will pass that on to you. As a matter of fact, why don't I uh, share this with our listeners before we go any further? Uh, you just were talking about how expensive marriages, uh, uh, divorces can be. Uh, well, uh, it is not inexpensive uh, to uh, maintain a, a, a broadcast podcast video cast. And if you folks can uh, do so, if you're able to do so, and only if you're able to do so and you are called to do so, we'd love your support financially. We have a paper account it is there for your security as well as ours and the email address that uh, both David can use and you can use uh, if you'd like to uh, when you go there you want to send and you click that and it says okay put in the email address of the person Richard at richarddugan.com that is richard at richard dugan d-u-g-a-n dot com and again i like paypal being the middleman because it uh, keeps track of everything and um you know if you overgave and you said oh wait a minute that was too much you can take it back and then send out what you want to send or if it wasn't enough you can send that out and uh, and, and it'll be great we will take the prayers, the energetic support, uh, good thoughts and feelings. We'll take them all because uh, we can use all of that uh, to uh, to keep this program going. And I will tell you, as I've said many times on this program, I will never put the burden on you, the listener, the viewer. It is on me. And if you can help me and support it, that's great. And when I am unable to and I can't keep it going then that's on me. I will never guilt somebody into supporting this program. I want you to do it freely and openly and uh, uh, feel that uh, what we're providing here on the program is of value to you and, and other folks. And apparently it is because we got over 52,000 lessons in less than four years on, uh, you, on the SoundCloud analytics. So New paradigms for a new, new world. paradigms for a new world is what we talk about. Uh, we talk about looking for those new ways of living because the old ways just aren't working. All you have to do is look around you. I mean, literally look around you and it's a mess. Our economic system and this, we're not just talking about America here. We're talking about globally. It's just, it's, it's unbelievable. You know, we're still doing, and, and Einstein was right. He says, uh, you know, insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. And that's what we've been doing. Right is doing the same thing over and over and over again. And we need to, uh, this is another area that we might talk about here in terms of all of this. Um, we promote here on this program, David, what's called the uh, decade of perfect vision. Started out with the year of perfect vision, 2020. 2020, exactly. And moved on to the decade of perfect I see, vision. I see. Good. And here's what we ask people to do. We ask them to participate in the decade of perfect vision by going within, by listening to that still small voice, by finding oh, a peaceful, calm space where they can relax, re-energize, rejuvenate, get inspiration, get encouragement, maybe a little education, a little wisdom that will help them move forward. And I'll tell you what, I don't know if, if you are able to encourage the participants to do any of that uh, within the context of the process, but I'll tell you what, if people would just get in touch with that still small voice, it would help them immeasurably. And it could conceivably shorten the process, maybe even eliminate the process and the expense. Because quite honestly, what a waste of resources, of time and money. I'll tell you something else. Uh, there have been a few Hollywood situations where people remarry. You remember, uh, I think Richard Burton and Elizabeth Taylor married yeah. twice. Oh, yeah. And I, and I, for some reason, I think that Lonnie Anderson and Burt Reynolds married twice. I'm not sure huh? about that. They did. But, but, and, and, and so that, that tells us that people often made a good choice the first time mm -hmm. 
and only when they go out and find something else. Now, you've been fortunate. You've been fortunate. So I'm not talking about you, but they sometimes go out and to get to marriage number two or marriage number three. And they say, why did I ever leave marriage number one? It's the reason is because they didn't appreciate their spouse at the time, which is why there's a commandment that says thou shalt appreciate your spouse. You don't want to find out when you're on the outside looking in that somebody else appreciates your spouse. And now you do too. And think how many, there've been a thousand songs written about that mistake. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Matter of fact, one kiss came to mind. I was thinking about, I heard on the radio uh, recently, a uh, country song about uh, how that's not me anymore. You know, uh, texting her and doing this and that and the other thing. That's somebody else. That's not me anymore. Yeah, but he was also talking about how the way he used to be. That's right. All right. And said, and that's not me anymore. And that goes to the heart of the song I wrote. I am a songwriter of one song. Uh, and the song. I have one record myself. I'm, what's that now? I have one recording record myself yes really well i i I'm, I'm glad we're in the same club here uh the title of the song is uh, for me is uh i'm a good man doing the best i can that's nice and where i'm going is where i'm coming from now that is sort of a, a cryptic homage to my parents and how they raised me that, that's very nice that's and, a good uh, and a very nice turn of phrase i'll add yeah um, uh, because how they raised me is you know, I mean, I, I've, I, and again, I say this as humbly as I possibly can, uh, that uh, my present wife's sister, who's since passed, whenever we would come to visit, and even after we moved here, we'd go out to the car, and I would open the door for her, and she'd get in, and I'd then go around the other side. And her sister would always say, Richard, your parents raised you right. That's right. Now, uh, uh, you know, um, it's just to me, that is a sign of appreciation, you know. Uh, I don't know if chivalry is dead. I hope not. Uh, but what I do know is that, you know, I, I want to show kindness to everybody, male and female, men and women. Um, well, you know, let, me, let me point out, some, this is a very, this should be a low bar. But I've heard it said that people, if the, if the bar is, is how you treat a good friend, <laughs> your spouse, you should be treating better. And yet I see so many instances where people say words to their spouse that they would never say to a good friend because they know they no longer have that friend. Exactly. Exactly. And so, 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 so let's, let's at least set the good friend standard for getting along with our spouses. Yeah. By the way, you'd think I wasn't much of a divorce lawyer since I want to help people save their marriages, but um, a well, lot of people come to me over the years. You could you could take on that slogan. It's not being used anymore. Reasonable solutions for reasonable people, uh, but you got to get to the reasonable person first, and uh, right. I, I'm sure that can be difficult. I have uh, another question regarding your practice and and, uh, uh, and and so forth. Your experience has there been a situation where, and again, they will share with you only what they want to. You That's never right. ask them That's to remove. Right. Um, has there ever been a situation where from your observation and experience, you're going, yeah, we need to bring this one to a quick close and get these two separated and divorced because of course, if, 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 there, if there is domestic violence, then we've got to make sure that nobody gets hurt anymore. But if they have children together, mm. we should not rule out and they should not rule out the possibility that the family is reunified under a new regime, so to speak, where there'll be no more domestic violence. Yeah. You know, I wouldn't expose anybody to, to domestic violence. Um, I was a champion of, of um, protecting women really before it was in vogue, at least here. Mm -hmm. uh, I was donating to the women's shelter um, and uh, very, very supportive of that. Uh, and, and by the way, every once in a while, we have a man who's being assaulted by his wife. I've got a video, which I can't show you because it's a client, but right. the wife has picked up the phone, which is about like this, and is pounding him in the video, and he's, he's doing this, he's filming it. So we got proof that she did it. Yeah. Now, what about, but, but there's also the, not just physical, there's mental, emotional, verbal abuse. Is that under the same category? Or is that something that's different? Well, it doesn't, you don't call the police over 
mental, emotional, and verbal abuse, but you might get a divorce over mental, emotional, and verbal abuse. But if they, if somebody's abusing somebody, again, let's just go back to the book. It, it, you're, you're not treating them as an equal. You failed the, that commandment. You're not appreciating your spouse. Um, so, so I want people not to get there. I want them to know the Ten Commandments of Marriage from the point of view of this divorce lawyer and, and, and avoid these mistakes. Just yesterday, a client was in my office. She was sad. I'm not mentioning names, so I can talk about it. She was sad because her husband, as she said, well, I'm not sure that I don't want to be in a marriage where he doesn't want me. But on the other hand, she was very, very sad that he didn't want her. Uh, and I don't know the particulars and I wouldn't describe them here, but she said, I want your book. I hope she reads it. I hope it helps her. I hope she goes to her husband and says, look, you've done, you've done this wrong and you've done this wrong, but if you would do this and this right, we'd be back together and we'd be happy. Yeah. That's, that's, that's the idea. This, these commandments are to be referred to and yeah. pointed out to difficult recalcitrant yeah. spouses. And I'm curious also, because you have had some successes in turning the divorce process around. Yeah. Uh, I'm curious how quickly, what's, what's been the quickest turnaround for a couple going through this process? Well, I'll tell you this, uh, I'll tell you this, Richard, actually, probably a third of the people who come in and meet, at least with this lawyer, who are, remember I said early in our conversation today, people are in some phase of, of a troubled marriage. Mm -hmm. They may be living together. They often are living together. And so they want to know what their legal rights are. And I tell them what their legal rights are. I, I, I listen to them long enough to understand as thoroughly as possible the picture that they're living in and hear them out as thoroughly as possible. And I even say, well, if your spouse were sitting in this chair right here, what would he or she say about the marriage? Because often that's where the real confession comes out. Somebody will tell me for an hour what's going on in the marriage. And then I say, well, what would your, let's say your husband say? And she'd say, uh, well, my husband says, um, I'm a drunk. Nobody mentioned drinking in the first hour, you understand. Mm -hmm. And I didn't ask. But it's amazing how when you ask them what the spouse would say, what comes out. Mm -hmm. But what I want to get to is approximately a third of the people who come in needing information leave armed with the information they needed and don't necessarily break up. Mm. So, so you say, how quick is the turnaround? Maybe as quick as our meeting. Mm. Uh, but mostly I hope I empower people when they're getting that initial consultation with knowing what their legal rights are, knowing what the other side's responsibilities are, sort of like your free speech uh, has needs the corollary about responsibility. Mm -hmm then they can go home and say, look, I, I, I've been to a lawyer and that scares the daylights out of the other spouse. And that can make things work better. Just those dropping those words um, on the other spouse. But I've been to another lawyer. I do. I've been to a lawyer. I know my legal rights and what you're doing or what you think is going to happen when we break up is wrong. I'm going to get half of what you've got. Um, in fact, there was a, a, a romantic comedy on TV a bunch of years ago where, where the man said, let's see, he said, he said, basically, I can get rid of you in the marriage to the wife. And she says, yeah, I can get rid of you and have half your stuff. So they stayed together in the TV show. Now, uh, have you ever had a situation, and that'll be the last question on this this uh, topic, have you ever had a situation where one or both parties just basically basically say, just give me the papers and let me sign. I don't care about the stuff. There are no kids involved. Okay, let's just make that clear. No kids involved. I don't care. I just want out. Yes. I've had a lady who came in and said, I don't want the cheese. I just want out of the trap. <laughs> and she has a sense of humor too. Yeah, I like that, and I, uh, that's why I can use that quote. But, We're talking uh, with uh, David Erdman. He is the author of the Ten Commandments of Marriage: Secrets of a uh, Divorce Lawyer. I'm Richard Dugan. This is Tell Me Your Story. David Erdman, uh, this is the point of the program where 
I ask my guest three final questions, the same questions I ask everybody. You may have addressed them a little bit during the program, but I like to ask them directly. Uh, before I do, though, David, I've got to let our listeners and viewers know that you can listen to this program on Sundays at 7 a.m. and 7 p.m., Monday mornings at 1 a.m., Wednesday mornings at 9 a.m., and that's our special edition of Tell Me Your Story. Uh, we stream live at richarddugan.com, and you can also also listen to the podcast because remember the radio broadcast you don't get everything because well you know we have a, a limited amount of time on the radio the terrestrial radio but the podcasts are on SoundCloud, iTunes, TuneIn Radio, Spotify, Stitcher, Player FM, Blueberry, iHeartRadio, Amazon Music, and many other platforms across the internet. We are also on YouTube where you can watch these interviews. And a reminder that we will be linked to David Erdman's website, the Ten Commandments of Marriage.com. We hope that you will uh, make it a point to go there and uh, pick up a copy of his book and read about David. He's a very extraordinary and interesting gentleman. We hope that you'll find out more about him. We also hope that uh, you will find it within your hearts to, uh, to support what we're doing here on the program, Tell Me Your Story. Uh, PayPal is uh, sort of our partners, if you will, uh, in that uh, we use them for uh, paying things as well as receiving donation support for this program. I will remind you, it's been a while since I've reminded you, we are not, we are not tax exempt. We are not a nonprofit, <laughs> but for PayPal does take a little portion, a little little piece, and they're entitled because they're providing this service. When you go to PayPal and you want to send, uh, put in my email address, richard at richarddugan.com. That's richard at richarddugan.com. And also participate in the Decade of Perfect Vision. Spend that quiet time going within. I think, uh, David, they would even refer to it sort of as your, in a manner of speaking, your prayer closet. Yeah. where you listen to that still small voice you can converse back and forth nothing wrong with that and just relax re-energize rejuvenate and um one of our one of our programmers actually our guests has said even if it's just for 60 seconds 60 seconds and maybe it will grow from there so with all of that said here we go the final three questions i'm looking forward to them as, as always i feel like i'm on a by, by the way the harder you throw them the further i can hit them <laughs> And I hope you hit them out of the park. <clears throat> uh, the first one is, who is David Erdman? David Erdman has had one of the most interesting lives a person could ever hope to have. Happily married to a wonderful woman. I was an investigator on the Senate Watergate Committee. I'm the only one in Charlotte, North Carolina, who worked on the Watergate Committee staff. And I've had a successful law practice, and I want to help people as I've really tried to help throughout my career, but wrote this book late in life after I could honestly say I'd met with more than 5,000 people at some stage of distress in their marriage. Um, I want to share what I've learned. I hope that it'll outlive me. What is it that you hope to or want to achieve through the work that you are doing now? Well, I want to I'm like every human being, I want a fulfilled life. And if I found what I was doing to be no longer fulfilling, then I would not do it any longer. But if it is fulfilling for me, and I'm providing a service that people wish to have and come to me for, um, that's, that's, um, that's fulfilling. But, but I live personally, a marriage centered life. I actually do. That's why I can write about it in this book. That's why one of the commandments is live a marriage centered life, because that's a decision. I told my wife 35 years ago that I had heard a concept, marriage centered life. And I said, we should do that. And she said, yeah, we should. And uh, we have, and we still know that we do. So, so um, that, that means the core of my life is not in this law office. It's at home with my wife. And finally, what is your life's purpose? Well, my life's purpose is to be creative. I've been creative. I've, you may not know this, or you may not be able to tell this, but I've practiced law in an almost unique manner, somewhat copied in my region, um, but I have pretty much 
made my own path, listened to my own tune, marched to my own drummer, because in every way in my law practice, I've tried to do it the way I would want it if I were the client. And that means complete transparency, which is kind of unheard of in my business. Mm. And, uh, and efficiency. I happen to have an engineering degree and I use it to be an efficient user of technology and time uh, and ideas. So I'm going to say I'm a creative person at core. Well, David, I, uh, I have thoroughly enjoyed our conversation. This has been, uh, uh, from my perspective, extraordinary. I also, though you don't know this, and I know you're not one, uh, but this, uh, this program that I do on a regular basis is my therapy. <laughs> well, happy I could be of any assistance, but I appreciate the, uh, the privilege of, uh, of appearing with you, Richard, and, uh, and thank you for your interest in my book. And if you don't mind, I'll just remind everybody, it's called The Ten Commandments of Marriage. Don't be fooled by any other books by the same name. Look for the one that says Secrets of a Divorced Lawyer. There are many imitations and only one original, and that's the one by David Erdman. And uh, we thank him again for joining us. And I thank you for listening to and watching Tell Me Your Story, New Paradigms for a New World. And until our next broadcast, podcast, videocast, love to lol. <laughs>